Welcome to Ira's Everything Bagel, where I talk with intriguing people about everything, their passions, pursuits, and points of view. Some people walk around the block for inspiration, while others walk greater distance for both inspiration and illumination. My guest, Suzanne Maggio, at 60 years old, decided to walk the 500-mile Camino de Santiago by herself. She is author of Estrella's Moments of Illumination along El Camino de Santiago, a memoir. And in the book, she shares the story of her walk along El Camino de Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Estrella's is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the usual places. And for everything about Suzanne, including her podcast, From Sparks to Light, go to SuzanneMaggio.com, and you can follow her on Instagram at Suzanne Maggio Author. And Suzanne, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, before we get into the book itself, and before we get into the walk itself, why did you decide that you needed something different in life, that you were going to fly halfway around the world and start walking as opposed to renting a car and driving? The million dollar question. Well, you can't drive to Spain, so that's one problem. <laughs> but you can take a ship. <laughs> <laughs> you could. I'm about to turn 60. I have had a long rich career as a social worker and educator. Uh, I have two grown sons who are now in their 30s and living independent lives. And I've been married to the same man for 38 years at this point. And Voluntary or involuntary? <laughs> voluntary, voluntary. Okay. Okay. Um, in this day and age, 38 years is a minor miracle because not too many marriages make it that long. Um, but, you know, I was at a point where I just was ready to do something, um, that would challenge me that would, uh, kind of shake things up. And I had just watched the movie, the way I've now seen that movie at least a dozen times, if not more, because it brings me back to walking each time I wa watch it. Uh, I read Cheryl Strayed's memoir, um, about walking the Pacific Crest Trail wild. And I was on, on an afternoon in the fall of 2018, I said out loud, as I am wont to do, I'm going to walk the Camino de Santiago. And my husband said, have a good time. <laughs> in other words, he's not coming. <laughs> he's not coming. He was watching the 49ers game and he said, have a good time. Uh, and I said, no, 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 I'm really serious. And he said, I know you are. Have a great time. And that was the beginning of the idea. And I went about planning and I headed to REI and outfitted myself with a backpack and all the things that I thought I would need. And in May of 2019, I set off for Spain. So uh, I had been before. I uh, When my youngest son went off to college, I taught in Barcelona for six months and I absolutely adore Spain. It's an extraordinary country. And um, so I was looking to return and this seemed like a pretty awesome plan to, to shake things up and see what happened. And then as I started to think about it and plan it, um, you know, it's clear my husband wasn't coming, but I had a couple of friends who said, oh, I'd like to go with you. I'd love to go with you. And I thought, you know, I want to go by myself. I want to really push myself. I want to see what it will be like to just, you know, challenge myself and put myself in a situation where I was a little uncomfortable um, and I wanted to see what would happen. And so that's, that's the that was the foundation of the journey. When you decided to do it, you talked about planning. And a lot of people I talk to who are very good travelers and who have written books. In fact, I'm thinking of one particular guest who told me about that. They spent more time on the planning. And as a result, they were very efficient and they very much enjoyed themselves. In your case, was there a lot of planning or just minimal planning? And then you kind of went by what you wanted to discover about yourself once you got there. So that's a great question because planning, I think, means different things to different people. So in my case, 
planning meant, you know, because it was going to be a walk and I was going to carry my belongings, I started reading about it. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet about walking the Camino. A lot of people have written blogs about it. There are books written about it. There are guidebooks. So I kind of began to look at that process, bought my equipment, bought my plane ticket. But the caveat to all of that is when you take a walk like the Camino or like any kind of adventure, you also have to be open to sort of letting go of the best plans and dealing with what's right in front of you. And that turned out to be one of the biggest gifts of the Camino because it ended up for me being so much more than I could have ever imagined it was going to be. And in fact, the actual practice of walking every day for 31 days, which is what I did, you can't really plan for that. You know, we, we even talk about a lot of people say, oh, did you prepare? Did you did you get in shape? Did you walk at home? Well, yes, I did all of those things, but that is nothing compared to walking 15 to 18 miles day in and day out. You, you can't really prepare for that. So when you get there, you really are walking yourself into shape. Um, you are, you can't imagine what it really is going to be like. I've never been, I love to travel and I've never been one of those folks who goes on pat tours mm -hmm. or has someone else plan my travel. My mother was a, a traveler and she taught us the love of travel and she did all the planning herself. She would, you know, research the places we were going to go and she would figure out where we were going to stay and what we were going to see. And so I have some of that in me but I also leave quite a bit of it sort of up to chance and try to take inventory on, you know, where am I today and what do I want to do mm -hmm. today? So I would sort of, I sort of think it makes sense to have a, a loose plan, but also not hang on to it so tightly that you lose opportunity. From what you said, it sounds like in addition to, as we get into the subject, in addition to emotional and spiritual transformation, there's a physical transformation because as you said, you're walking a lot and you're getting yourself in shape by walking every day that many miles. So that's got to recast yourself into a whole different person. It, it really does. It's, it, there is a, it's both physical, spiritual and, and mental and, and it really is, you know, there's so many metaphors about walking the community of Santiago. And there's so many metaphors about walking. Really, you can think about how do we prepare ourselves for the challenges that are around the corner that we don't even know exist. And so that is really what happens when you start walking. And the very first day on the Camino is up over the Pyrenees. It's a very hard day. It's by far the hardest day on the entire walk. And it's your very first day. So that for me, I remember going back and looking at my journal after I had returned home and I, and I wrote in my journal, this is the hardest walk I have ever done. Couldn't um, you have reversed it and started at the other end and that way it would have been your hardest day at the end? You could have, and that would have been awful. <laughs> Bad idea, Ira. <laughs> I'm sorry, just a thought. <laughs> so the, what's fascinating though, you were traveling as a solo female. So I'm sure there were issues of, to some degree, some security aspects of it, but that doesn't seem to be an issue so much on um, in this walk as as opposed to walking down to the local convenience store to get a Slurpee or something. I think that's true. Um, I never felt in danger in any way. And, uh, I, you know, I think those long distance walks, and I've done three of them at this point, I just returned from walking the Via Francigena in Italy. Um, in fact, I just I'm just home a couple of weeks, uh, and I've never have felt uh, in any way threatened. The Camino de Santiago is widely trafficked um, in terms of there are a lot of people walking it. There are a lot of places to stay. Um, Spain has done a remarkable job of supporting that journey. 
And so anyone that's interested in going alone, particularly um, if you're at all worried about safety, there, there really is no reason to be. There's, there's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty safe as far as mm -hmm. my experience. And, and that's, and that is even with the caveat, as I talk about in my book of getting robbed the first night. Um, ah, okay. Then. And a bunch of us got robbed uh, when we were sleeping. Um, and, you know, again, uh, it wasn't like it was out when I was walking alone. I was in a dormitory full of hundreds of pilgrims. So um, it was it had nothing to do with me being female. Well, so um, technically it's burglary rather than robbery. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was a burglary. You were all asleep yeah. and we're going yeah. in and getting it. Yeah. But you, all, you were able to continue despite that, that incident. Yeah, well, you know what? I have to say that I am fairly privileged, right? So I had money stolen and I could just go to the bank and get more. Now, that was not true for um, some of the folks that I walked with. Uh, they had thousands of dollars that they had brought. I had a, a friend of mine from that I that I met while I was walking from India, and she had brought everything she had saved for a long time. And so it really changed the experience for her. She was right. far less able to participate in some of the fun experiences I did, such as going out with for, you know, for a meal. Um, mm -hmm. She was afraid to do that because she was worried about money. Right. So in my case, yes, it happened and it was a bummer, but I was able to continue right. normally. What is it about this particular walk along El Camino de Santiago as opposed to any other walk? In other words, you don't have to give us a whole historical perspective that that will go on for five hours because this is only a 30 minute show but <laughs> what is it about specifically about that walk that draws people draws pilgrims draws from all over the world it's a well it is a spiritual pilgrimage but that being said it's not necessarily the case that everyone that walks is there for spiritual reasons and so it's an established pilgrimage. It's been around for, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so it's known. And like I said, there's quite a bit of infrastructure. There are places to stay. There are places to eat. Um, there are, uh, you know, masses if you want to go to church. Uh, people go and use the opportunity to pray and meditate. But I think in general, and I and I like to think more of it as a spiritual, maybe with a small s spiritual mm -hmm. journey, in that when you walk for that long, when you are in a opportunity, you have the opportunity for there to be quiet and silence and reflection. Um, when you move outside your comfort zone, when you shut off the noise of everyday life you create an opportunity for change to occur for something to happen and for most of the people that walk um something happens it might not be what they thought was going to happen that was clearly the case for me but by the time you get home you realize that you are different in some way than you were when you left and you know, I, I teach psychology. So the reality is that we change through every experience we have. We are never left the same when we learn something new. But it's a pretty remarkable experience. And, you know, I don't know what it's like for someone who walks a shorter stretch of it, because not everyone walks the full Camino. But I can tell you that for me, walking from beginning to end left me changed. When you got home, did your husband notice the change? Because sometimes people who are gone for a while, even if it's not what you did, but they're gone for a month and they come back, there's change based on their own experiences, whatever those happened to be. But did your husband notice any major change, especially when you came home with that Spanish boyfriend? 
<laughs> yes, uh, that was that was a bit of an in inconvenience for him, wasn't it? <laughs> no, uh, only kidding. He, only kidding. Robert. I know he he did absolutely, and he did because my, in particular, one of the biggest changes was my experience of him, and you know, like I said at the introduction, we've been married for a very long time, and I think when you are fortunate enough um, to know someone for a very, very long time. The, the problem with that, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse because, you know, the blessing is that you have the, the steadiness and consistency and benefit of a relationship. The downside is that you tend to pigeonhole people and put them in boxes and believe that you know everything there is to know about somebody. And one of the most profound things that happened for me when I was walking happened on the very first day. And I was waking up early in saint jean pied de port in my bunk bed. And I opened up my cell phone and took a look at my text messages. And there was a text message from my husband. And it said, uh, have a wonderful walk today. We're so proud of you. Uh, we miss you and we look forward to hearing how your walk goes. And then every single morning from that point on, there was a supportive and encouraging message from my husband. That first morning when I got that, I was surprised. I had never received anything like that from him before. And jokingly, I responded to him in that message who is this and what have you done with my husband? <laughs> and of course he laughed and and it kind of went on from that. There were pictures of my dogs certain days. There were pictures of my gardens that he was taking care of. There were, um, you know, just um, reflections on pictures that I had posted that he could see. But it really was a way in which he was truly supporting me as I walked and mm -hmm. I felt it. I wasn't really alone. And um, and that changed the way I understood him. It really offered me a new window into who this man was that I thought I knew so well. Um, and so when I came home, he could see that. Yeah, well, he, you found him to be considerate, which before you thought, well, he's not, he's just my husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you raise an interesting question about the phone, because in a way you're you're taking this walk which in part is spiritual and it's alone time and you're away from the noise. But are you, when you have a phone where you can open up and look at texts and you can look at social media, does it really afford you that space? I think it's a choice. And I would, um, the very first time I did it, um, I made the decision to only use Wi-Fi, And that meant that I could only connect when I was in the lodging at night or I was in a cafe uh, that had Wi-Fi. And so I did not use my phone while I was walking. I used it in, in the evening to post pictures so my family and friends could see where I was and I could communicate with them and they could communicate with me. I didn't look at news. I didn't listen to podcasts. I didn't listen to music. I didn't do any of that uh, with my phone. And I made that choice because I really wanted to be fully present in the walking. And it was funny because, you know, there were people obviously that did listen to music that did, you know, have their, you'd walk past them and they'd have their headphones on or they'd be on the phone or they'd be, that was not the way I wanted to do it. So it's always a choice. Right. And you found a balance. So you, as you said, you only you used it with, with Wi-Fi and when you had access to Wi-Fi, which brings up something else, which is, when you are seeing those many people walking with you and you know the whole history, is there a danger that, and you referenced the Spanish government doing a lot of good for this El Camino de Santiago area, but is there a danger that it can get too touristy? That's what they're struggling with right now, to be honest. After COVID, um, I think a lot of folks after being shut in for two years, uh, have sort of understood that um, if 
they want to travel, they better do it. And if they want to walk the Camino, they better do it. And so what's happened in the last couple of years, at least what I'm hearing, is that the, the most trafficked walk, the most walked um, path mm -hmm. that from saint jean pied de port to Santiago is very, very busy. In fact, it's so busy that certain times of the year, they're actually discouraging people from walking it and rec recommending that you come at a different time when there are less, less people. Um, and so I think that is true. And I fortunately did not have that experience when I walked in 2019, there were, um, there were people on it certainly. And I met wonderful people that I write about in the book, but it wasn't so busy that there weren't days when I walked by myself or walked alone for a long stretch. And I think that's really important. I think there's something about, you know, that kind of massive mobs of people. And you see some of that towards the end of the walk, the last 100 kilometers of the walk from a town called Saria, which is, uh, it's towards the towards the end, the last couple of days, that section of the walk, that last 100 kilometers is really all you have to walk to be able to qualify for the Compostela, which is the certificate at the end. So quite a few people start there and the road gets very busy. And I really didn't like that part of the walk. That was my least favorite part of the walk. Now, that being said, there are many, um, trails there are many paths so i walked the second camino that i did was the camino primitivo and that starts in a town called oviedo which is in the north of spain and goes to santiago the next one that i want to walk is the camino del norte which is the one that starts from irun and goes to santiago and that's a very long one that's about a 40-day walk so that'll take some some time to be able to do that one those ones are far less trafficked. And so, you know, there are a lot of people also that walk from Portugal. There's a, a Camino uh, Portugues, which starts in Porto. There's one that does, is the coastal route that goes up the coast of, of uh, Portugal. There's an English route that goes from the far west tip of Spain to Santiago. So people that want to walk the Camino can choose one of these other routes and have a much more mm, kind of quiet, mm -hmm. uh, contemplative experience. Why did you decide to write the book? You had the experience, and perhaps in the future, when you do another walk, your husband will go with you now that you've done it solo, which would be good for him, I would think. But what made you decide to write the book? When I came home, I came home to COVID. And uh, I walked in 2019. Um, I felt quite, I want to say shaken, but I'm not sure that's the right word, but I had this sense that something had happened and I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. And so, but I knew it was profound. I knew that I was different in some way. And I knew that that experience was one that I wanted to try to articulate. I had a lot of people say, how was it? How was it? And they would say things like, you know, what was it like walking all those miles? And did your feet hurt? And, and when I would answer them, the answer didn't do the experience service justice, right? It was like, but it's more than that. It wasn't really, it reminds me of the old, uh, I think it was a Lance Armstrong memoir, it's not about the bike or something like that. I felt like it wasn't really about the walk in a way, right? It wasn't about walking. It was about what happens when you're walking. Mm -hmm. And, and so the writing of the book became my effort to try to understand what had happened. And I didn't intend to write a book. It wasn't like I went into it thinking, oh, I'm going to write a book on this. Um, I wrote the book because I wanted to try to make sense of what had happened. And 
the good news was for me that in writing the book during COVID, it was a little bit like being able to walk the walk again mm -hmm. when I, we couldn't go anywhere. Before I let you go, we have about a minute left. What do you want people to take away from your book? I know they can take away a lot because we've talked about a lot of aspects of this. What, what do you think or what do you believe that people will take away from your book? I think the biggest message in this book and is really about creating opportunity to grow and challenge and open yourself up to experiences that can help you do those things. We don't grow as much when we're comfortable. We grow when we're uncomfortable, right? Discomfort are, is opportunities for us to grow. And so my hope is that in reading this book, two things will happen. One is that you'll be inspired to take risks and to put yourself out there and do the things that you dream about doing. And the other is to recognize the profound impact that we have on one another. And in truth, that was one of the most important lessons for me was I got to meet people from all over the world that I then became friends with, that I still talk to, that I still visit with. Um, and those experiences, those opportunities to experience life through someone else's eyes and experience who grew up in a place very different than, than I grew up, who, who lives in a country that has a very different history, um, who values different things. Those were profound gifts. And I think it's one of the things that we talk about in my podcast. We all have the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of someone else. And so I'm hoping that both the inspiration to travel, but also the inspiration to really see the world through someone else's eyes is one that they'll get from reading the book. Well, I think that's a great way to leave it. My guest has been Suzanne Maggio. She's author of Estrella's Moments of Illumination, a long El Camino de Santiago, a memoir. Estrella's is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the usual places. And for everything about Suzanne, including her podcast called Sparks to Light, go to SuzanneMaggio.com. And you can follow her on Instagram at Suzanne Maggio Author. And Suzanne, thanks for being on the show. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. Sure. And join us every Thursday for a new schmear on Ira's Everything Bagel.